Thank you. It's a, such a pleasure to be here. And it's a really a tremendous honor and pleasure to be here with, with Marcela, Alejandro, and, and Joao to talk about Latin American independence. And as you know, you know, 200 years ago, these are complex and diverse uh, regions in the Americas that used to be part of the Spanish and the Portuguese empires broke their ties with these Iberian empires and began a very complex process of independence, uh, either forming independent nations or as in the case of Brazil, an independent empire. So the 2020s, you know, the, this decade that we just started is marking a period of commemoration of these uh, 200 years of Latin American independence and is asking us to revisit and rethink how we have understood Latin American independence uh, and basically kind of analyze and restore the geopolitical dimensions of this complex process and its uniqueness and also the global reverberations that this process has had uh, in, in general. So we can say with confidence, and this is something that my, my colleague Marcel and I have been thinking about basically because we have been co-editing this uh, Cambridge Companion of Latin American Independence, but we can say with confidence that the field of Latin American Independence and the historiography have had a very powerful uh, restoration in the last 20 years. And there have been historians everywhere, not only in Latin America, but in the United States and in Europe, rethinking and contributing uh, creating like new questions about how to understand Latin American independence and also how to see it in the context of what we know today and, and it's kind of a very vibrant field, which is a global history. So I, I wanted to first uh, start with, and again, these, uh, we have like some questions that I already circulated among my colleagues, but I want to think of on like big teams that we should be discussing tonight. And I think that just because these are, the avenues that the historiography have taken in the last 20 years, I would say oh, if we could go farther, maybe the 30 years and uh, has been very productive. And, and I guess the first question that I have has to do with including or not, or into what extent including Latin American independence in our understanding of the uh, age of revolution, what kind of conversations and, and kind of a disruptions or Enhance, enhancement of views have created for the historiography in general. So as you, as, as we know, we have discussed this several times in the more traditional view of the age of democratic revolutions in this kind of a Palmerian formulation, uh, Latin American independence was not included as part of the, the discussion, right? And it was like a very traditional view. Latin American independence was always seen as something separate or different, but in the last two decades, historians everywhere, not only in Latin America, but in the United States and Europe have been working on the idea of integrating or including Latin American independence process in this idea of the age of the Atlantic revolutions. And perhaps one of the first moments we see this shift is uh, in this uh, Lester Langley's book uh, that came out around 19, the end of the 1990s called the Americas in the Age of Revolution. And it's the first time where we see not only Latin American independence as part of the discussion of the Age of Revolution, but also the Haitian uh, Revolution as well. So it's a book that looks comparatively into the American Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, and the Latin American independence. And then we see that this idea have already been cemented and solidified in Wind Cluster's uh, book that we, I know many of us use when we teach, which is you know, the revolutions in the Atlantic world. So, so I guess the first uh, kind of a theme that I think we should cover is into what extent, including the Latin American independence processes within this uh, larger scope of the age of revolution uh, have been uh, interesting, have been creating new discussions. How do you think the including Latin American independence have enhanced or complicated our views of, on the age of revolutions? And, uh, and we can go different ways. We can talk about, you know, um, like expanding the region or understanding the connections between different regions uh, or expanding the, periodic, uh, the periodization uh, into what extent thinking about the crisis of colonial rule at the end of the 18th century also expands our understandings of the age of revolution. So I, I would leave the question open for you, for any of you to take uh, over and, and just 
give us some ideas why has been important, interesting uh, to include Latin American independence in, in the discussion, conversation about the Atlantic revolutions. So whoever wants to jump in. So who starts? You. I, okay. So thank you. First of all, thank you very much for this invitation. This is a wonderful opportunity to be able to share this panel with my dear friends and colleagues. And we be able to talk with you to, to you from so far away, virtually. So I'm really glad to be here. And I think that what the Latin, Latin American movements add to the age of revolution studies has to do mainly with a, an extra layer of complexity, we could say. Not in the sense only on only in the sense that it adds a lot of cases to the studies but also in the sense that Latin American arena seems to me to be more complex than what happened in North America formally, formally more complex than what happened in North America and Europe. And in North America, I know I'm oversimplifying right now, but for the sake of argument, in North America, you have 13 colonies that are different between them, but are quick enough uh, to, have a single government with a continental congress, a continental army, and eventually a general constitution. In Europe is different, but you also have a main hub of revolutionary activity in France that sort of radiates the revolution to the rest of Europe. In Latin America, on the other hand, it's quite difficult to identify such massive centers of gravity. Mm -hmm. From the onset, we have four royalties, three general captaincies. They covered an immense territory, and they will all experience different revolutionary struggles that have very little coordination between them, and that will eventually give birth to a host of independent countries, most of them Republicans, but with the crucial exception of Brazil. So what we have is a very large and very complex laboratory for Republican politics and for revolutionary warfare. And I think that it has more moving parts and therefore more possibilities for meaningful interaction than the European and North American cases. Mm. And this will give birth to some new phenomena that we hardly saw in the North American or European theaters. To give you just one example that I am currently studying, what the contemporaries called the liberating armies, the all important ejércitos libertadores. Mm -hmm. When we think about it, these are quite a peculiar kind of military institution. We are talking about revolutionary armies that go fight the royalists abroad, meaning in a jurisdiction that it's not their own, but they renounce the right of conquest that up to that point had been the main principle of international law. Thus, liberating the new country and leaving the locals to rule themselves as they saw fit. This is a kind of endeavor that could not emerge in North America. And even in Europe, the imbalance between France and the territories it claimed to liberate was so vast that the new republics quickly became satellites of the metropole. So here we have a clear example of a new product of the age of revolutions and a very important one that we only get to study in the Latin American theater. Yeah, and in, in fact, one of the, I mean, one of the things that I have been thinking about and as we, Marcel and I work on, the, on this uh, companion is just like, why was never included? If we look into like more intellectual history from the perspective of the Latin American, uh, people themselves, they, they even thought of their processes as being connected to revolutionary processes started in North America and France. So of course, that's one of the questions that I have, like historiographically, and, and maybe Marcela or, or Joao wants to, to address this, this kind of a sub question, like historiographically, uh, there have been this uh, denial of those connections that, you know, the every uh, Latin American nation had with this kind of a larger context. So I do wonder if, I mean, I, in one hand, you know, there's like geopolitics of knowledge in the sense that 
in the Palmerian reformulation, when we think about the age of you know, democratic revolutions, it was about dealing with two important revolutions that were based on the idea of these are democratic values. And so, somehow these are ideas of this shadow of caudillismo or kind of a semi-dictatorial system, like put that aside, right? That's one thing. But the other thing is that I have been thinking to what extent, even within the Latin American regions that got their independence, uh, not only Brazil, but the, the, the uh, recent created uh, nations, there was an hesitation to see the process as integrated into a global uh, revolution later in the historiography. And that's why, you know, I wonder to what extent there's a lack of inclusion of the Latin American uh, processes within the scope of the age revolution have been uh, a response or a consequence of kind of a more nationalistic uh, theologies or, or discourses, right? And I wonder if, if you have an interpretation why this has been like a, like a, why is it only took us in the last two decades or three decades to see Latin American independence within the context of the age of revolutions? That's kind of a my question. I know, if Mar I know Marcela is a, is, is a histor historiographical person, so right. go ahead. No, I'm happy to, but I mean, I, I, I hope I can remain kind of focused because there were at least three different things that I wanted to say connected with what Alejandro already said and, and your mm -hmm. more recent questions. And, and perhaps even beginning with the, the, the original question about what, what do we add or what happens when we include Latin America in the age of revolutions paradigm. I wanted to stress the question of chronology, which was implicit in the things you already told us in that, in that um, short summary, because I think that it was very easy to exclude Latin America with that criteria. It was just very mm -hmm. simple to say, we're gonna go and focus only on the 18th century, right? And then obviously, since the Latin American independence uh, processes are going to take place in the 19th century, they would just simply be outside. And what was interesting, and this connects more to your, your latter point, was how they became somewhat the uh, inheritors mm -hmm. of those revolutionary processes that had taken place outside of Latin America that were, of course, North Atlantic processes and that therefore were quite defining. And the real question is really how, right? Because uh, it was not seen necessarily as, as part of processes, but also somewhat constructed through um, the lens of ideas, right? Like the, a very intellectual and theoretical understanding of how these uh, demo democratic ideals came to be important in Latin America. So uh, that's one point that I think is important to think about because that expansion of the chronology of the age of revolutions is absolutely radical in, mm -hmm. in the effects that it has in the way that we have been doing it as historians ourselves. Um, but I want to also highlight something you mentioned already, which is that in between the 18th and 19th centuries is the Haitian Revolution, which of course is another super, super important, um, mm -hmm. let's call it addition to this paradigm or to this trajectory that has also made uh, the, the, the incorporation of Latin America much more interesting because now we can never think uh, outside of uh, some of the central issues that Haiti has brought into the paradigm as well, which is obviously the question of slavery and in, in connection to that, the, the questions of race. Mm -hmm. um, so just to say at the same time that I think, and this will connect more with Alejandro's points, I think that another thing that is, is important when you look through, and, and this is no surprise given my, my work in general, but it, through the lens of Latin America is the question of, of monarchy. And, and here, fortunately, Brazil also plays an important role in, in helping us think how much we were missing or how much I think we were misguided mm -hmm. by making the age of revolutions or by identifying and, and making revolution mean anti-monarchism, for example, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, one interpretation that was kind of stemming from this uh, earlier paradigm that supposedly stressed the democratic uh, thrust. So I think that by understanding on one hand that the revolution in the, not just the Latin American context, but the Iberian and Hispanic context, I will say, uh, is linked to 
processes of creations of constitutional monarchies in which what one of the central processes is of course the rise of Hispanic liberalism. Um, we really start to see some shades and nuances that were practically impossible to understand or to conceive of or even to appreciate and, and really uh, explore in, in the earlier version of the paradigm. So one thing I would say is uh, really thinking through this question of uh, how do we understand revolution not against the monarchy but within mm -hmm. the monarchy is, is a point that I think is, is really worth uh, highlighting. That's a, that's a great point. Thank you, Marcela, because I do think that we have these two very important moments, which is 1808 with the Napoleon invasion of the Iberian Peninsula, but then in the Spanish case, the 1812 moment, which is the constitution of Cadiz. So, so what you're saying is that basically we should also include the Iberian uh, context within our ideas of, of the age of revolution. And with this, I wanted to, to also move to, to Joao's work and, and precisely kind of a follow up with the, with the theme that Marcela already introduced that's so complicated. How do you see Brazilian independence within the context of the age of revolutions? Precisely because it has, it has this hiccup that was not easy digested by people because it, was, it became an empire. So, so what, is your, how, what has been the contribution that you think including Brazilian independence into the age of revolution have you know, brought to the field? overall. Well, hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and to share this session with you. For me, Christina and colleagues, there are no doubts that Latin American independence movements, including Brazil, of course, including Brazil, are part of the same historical unit. If we must name this unit age of revolutions, age of democratic revolution, revolutions, age of imperial revolutions, are other or other similar expressions is another, another discussion. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But the most important for me is not to consider, not to consider each of these movements as a sort of isolated world. As a result, do not exaggerate its singularities. In my work, I have been trying to stress the historical unit, this historical unit, in terms of their temporal connections. By that, I mean the many ways in which one movement could learn something from the other as one happened after the other or before the other, of course. Mm -hmm. There are no models and no strict boundaries here for me. In the historical dynamics of that epoch, ideas, concepts, political projects, experiences, and expectations were changing all the time becoming something different from uh, one place to the other, something new for one place to the other, and from one time to the other. Latin America, with its own colonial logic, logics, is part of the whole picture, of course. And in the case of Brazil, perhaps the most distinguishing frame is the fact that it became the center of the Portuguese empire mm -hmm. in 1808, as you said, during the Napoleonic Wars, almost everything that happened with Brazil after 1808 is connected to this unusual event. And um, one last word about this topic. Uh, it's true that uh, Palmer's book uh, has two great empty spaces, uh, Latin American and, and Haiti also. But I, I really appreciate uh, Palmer's book. I think he made a, a great job <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the 50s. Yeah. And uh, everyone who wants to write uh, such a great synthesis um, will, will miss something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, just to, to not be uh, unfair with a, a great author. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, and in fact, I mean, in fact, and, and I agree with you, Joao. In fact, I mean, we see it as a, a springboard of, of discussion that has been very regenerative for the historiography. It just, it's just like, it, it's, it's the kind of shoulders where everything else has, you know, piled up to, to produce uh, these are kind of amazing things that have been produced in the last uh, 30 or 20 years. So yeah, I, I, I think uh, I'm not being ex extremely critical, just saying that there were certain parts that were missing and I'm happy we have been kind of recovering those, those parts. Marcela, you wanted to add something? 
Yes, because I think I may have forgotten, but uh, to, to say that it's also interesting in, the, in, in, in thinking about how we define revolution, how the impact of, of, of um, playing with this possibility of being part of the age of revolutions uh, in, in, in thinking about Latin American independence has transformed what we understand the independence processes themselves to be. And so this is something that is also a very Latin American, let's say, uh, discussion, but it has to do with how we had inherited, I mean, I, our generation had inherited a, an idea that the independence wars and processes were not revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And so it has been really in part in dialogue with that paradigm, as you, as you suggested from the beginning, but in part really the question of, of understanding uh, a new understanding of political history and, and of broadening this, this term of, of revolution to really think more carefully about what were the transformations that took place in this period. And I think, I mean, I would obviously love to hear uh, whether my co-panelists agree, but I think that right now we, we, we really think this was a revolutionary process when seen from different points of view and particularly when seen from different perspectives of the social actors that were involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on that. Like, are they? So I guess Mar Marcela is kind of asking into what extent, I'll, I'll correct me, Marcela, if I, I, I don't I follow in, but I, I, I wonder if you're asking to what extent the political actors or the historical actors were aware of the revolutionary movement moment. Is that what you're kind of asking? That's one side. And even although just to say it, obviously historians rarely agree, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also all, almost pushing us to agree that, that we think they are revolutions in a way. I mean, in a way that's kind of our starting point when we talk about this today as mm -hmm. historians. <laughs> yeah, I think that there's no doubt that the actors themselves, the, the contemporaries, they, they talked about revolution from the onset of the, the process, but they had various definitions of what that was. Mm -hmm. So there's like our idea, historiographical idea of a huge event that really changes the social fabric of a nation. I think that we are very influenced by the idea of the Russian revolution when we think that way. And maybe in the Hispanic world, it, the need of such social reform was not necessary to the definition of revolution. So mm -hmm. we historians have the problem to discuss. And there's a debate actually of what was revolutionary in these revolutions. Mm -hmm. The Asian case is clearly revolutionary in a sense, in a social sense, but the North American or the Spanish American revolutions, well, they're more political than social. So that's really a, a debate field, but I think that the, the political independence that came about from that started many social issues that maybe not in the first decade or so, but eventually get to very big transformations. And in, in, in its own right, the political independence was a revolution. And I tend to agree with the contemporaries. If they thought they were doing a revolution, we are not allowed to say otherwise. Mm -hmm. May I say something? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I totally agree with Alejandro. In my work, I use the, the, the idea of rev revolution uh, applied to Brazil and also to Spanish American um, independence movements. But I think that the uses of um, such an idea as revolution depends also on each country's traditions and uh, how I would say ghosts around rounding this word revolution. Mm -hmm. What revolution means in each country nowadays, in the last decades, in the last two centuries, there are something to explore uh, there or, uh, in terms of these ties and the connection of the two ideas, revolution revolutions and independences movements mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i think i mean i think recently we have been talking about revolutions as these kind of amazingly powerful moments of destruction and creation so it's not attached to kind of a ideological uh, values or particular ideas but just the feeling that historical actors had that there was a moment of kind of a destruction 
construction of something and creation of something new. And that's what, you know, that's why it becomes so powerful. So that, you know, into, into that extent, and this is kind of something we're gonna try to discuss at the end, uh, the Latin American independence process is a turning point in the history, not only of Latin America, but of in this course. kind of a, you know, kind of global uh, understanding. I wanted to move now to, to something that I, I know Professor Pimenta has been uh, kind of a, uh, an advocate and, and it's funny because we all Latin American historians, Spanish American uh, or from the Spanish American regions kind of have, have been following your work, which is the need to connect Brazilian independence processes with the rest of the Hispanic, Hispanic America or Spanish American uh, independence. Um, we think that, you know, in a way uh, there has been in the last 20 years a challenging of these kind of a nationalistic discourses that we people just kept doing the history of their nation states and, and using that as, as the scope. And, and here we have a huge debt with the Atlantic world perspective, I think, uh, humbly, I think we have been all, you know, understanding that our regions, the regions that we have been focused on, connects in very different ways with other regions. So, so I wanted to ask this kind of question, how, because Marcel already mentioned that uh, the integration of Latin American processes in the Atlantic perspective have also have to do with the expansion of the periodization. Uh, we have been going to like early periods and that's where I see myself looking into the colonial crisis and we have extended to, you know, well, the 19th century, but there has always, it, there has also been a very important movement of opening up the regional, regional frame. And I think one of the most interesting thing is just now thinking of the Iberian Atlantic as the unit to look at. And by looking at the Iberian Atlantic, then we are taking into consideration Brazil along with the other Spanish American regions and Portugal and Spain. So I wanted to ask how has this opening of the uh, regional framework have contributed complicated our understanding of Latin American independence as a whole. And I don't know, uh, Joao, if you wanna begin because you are the reference here. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, well, I would say that nowadays nationalist approaches are totally out of fashion in the writing of professional historians. We don't need to spend much effort criticizing the 19th century's ways of historical writing or the myopia of studies <clears throat> based entirely on one country when they are devoted to themes such as Latin American independences. Mm -hmm. We live in a context where international networks, digital databases, and collaborations between universities, between us, um, uh, are not uh, exceptions, but the rule. Even so, even so, Against this rule, most of historical studies in our country, also in the United States, are mainly national studies. They are focused on only one country. Why? In my opinion, simply because we, start, we all start thinking history inside national educational systems our cultural markets remain mainly national too, and the easiest way to research in primary sources is to keep inside a national history. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, national approaches reveal a kind of social necessity related to the many ways that societies can afford a national cohesion. That's normal for me. And Latin American independence, nevertheless, uh, and um, their relationships with the so-called age of revolutions and <laughs> other expressions provide great invitations to do things in a different way, I think. According to my personal experience, at least, I would say that a good starting point is to explore to study different national historiographical traditions, mm -hmm. learning from them to finally go beyond them. I don't think a good starting point is to, well, just from the, the first moment to think globally or something like that. I think it's important to think in terms of um, 
previous traditionals, previous works, previous, um, well, ideas, and then starting to build something more large in terms of uh, historiographical scope, at least according to my personal experience. I like to think this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and in, in that note, I, I do think like the tension here is like in one hand, and here I'm kind of a following uh, some of the ideas that I have shared with Marcel as well. In one hand, we have this idea of the Atlantic as a unit, and we think even as, you know, the colonies and the empire as being in the same analytical unit. But there's also been an interest of, from historians, and I, I think of Marcela's work in particular, like understanding regions, like so concentrated in one region, for example, within Nueva Granada, Marcela was able to look into kind of a royalism, right? Like just, uh, so I wonder is the movement should be like, like twofold. In one hand, you think from an Iberian perspective or an Atlantic Iberian perspective, but not losing uh, your sight on regional dynamics. And I think, you know, Alejandro also works in, in that way, right? When we think about militarization in Argentina, you're also thinking on, re on regions, right? Like regional uh, processes. So is this something that you see as contributing to the Atlantic perspective, focusing on kind of a, or developing regional analysis? Uh, and this is a question open to either Marcela or, or Alejandro. I think that uh, Joao raises some important questions. Up to this point, we've been talking mainly about integrating uh, Spanish American revolutions inside the bigger age of revolution. More of, talking about a uh, North American perspective historiographically, but this shift in historic uh, scholarship from the last 20 to 30 years has had a big impact also in national historiographies in South America and Latin America in general. And we really had blinders for, for many decades with regards to our neighbors and their historiography. Mm -hmm. And with regards to Brazil, many the biggest blinders of all, as if Brazil was something else. No, right now we know for a fact that they were a major player in the revolutionary period, just by the fact that they were one of the biggest counter-revolutionary actors, and they, they were very influential in the they did. But one of the things that opens up with this shift is that allowing us to cross the border with our analysis, suddenly, instead of uh, concentrating on what differences each case and with what makes Argentina, Argentina, and Chile, Chile, and Peru, Peru, we now see the connections. And that was always missed in the earlier works. I think that the potential for connected history at this stage of, as an approach, at this stage of uh, historiography, it's, it's great in Latin America and Iberian American as a, as a general point of analysis. What connected these distant cities, these groups, these uh, outcomes, uh, individuals, ideas, information, money, armies, things that cross the border and take with them uh, some insight of the revolution to another province which never would have led before the revolution. Mm -hmm. And you, you ask us, Christina, to give concrete examples of where this could lead. And mm -hmm. right now I'm, I'm, I'm studying a, a very little uh, subject of a company of men, a good militiamen recruited in the rivers of the Orinoco, mm -hmm. in Venezuela. And they followed Bolivar all across the Andes for many years, the Peruvian Andes for many years. And then later deserted to the northern provinces of Argentina and sell their service as mercenaries to the provinces in the civil war. This is something that could never have happened before the revolution. Mm -hmm. And it's a challenge in terms of documentation, but when we get there, when we get the documents to, to see what their worldviews were, what their strategies were, how they saw this experience, it's fantastic. And it adds something that I, re I really think it's unique to Latin American experience and to the bigger frame of revolutionary studies. 
Thank you. Marcela, do you want to add Well, anything? but before I want to ask Alejandro, so you, have you been now doing research also in where? In Colombia and Venezuela for these sources or yeah. where? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I've been in Bogota. And then uh, I have friends everywhere. So they send me the documents. <laughs> oh, we're so glad to hear about this. This is wonderful. No, and I agree. I mean, I've been thinking one of the things I wanted to say, which is, is just really great to hear Alejandro uh, speak about it before, is how what we really want to now um, explore more and more and more are those connections. I was going to use the same word as you used, because I think that it's kind of the discovery of this whole field of, of, of experience, I guess, that is, is still open. I think in many ways, if, if anything, I would like to also say to, to the people who are viewing us and listening to us, is it's really a field that is growing, uh, expanding, and in a very exciting moment. And, and a big part of it is precisely how can we learn more about two things that were already mentioned, the, the relationship of the, of the more local or regional uh, processes with mm -hmm. these broader ones, right? Like this is still a big question and, and to be explored in, in obviously many cases. And then the other question of the connections that Alejandro was just mentioning, which also can take many forms, right? Because we know already as he gave us the example of people who are literally moving across the continent um, in the military processes, but you obviously have the longer standing questions about um, you know, intellectual history, perhaps mm -hmm. in different forms, uh, shapes and forms, questions about the law uh, that are also gaining new, new kind of uh, relevance when we think across this uh, previously thought to be more um, kind of a tight frontier uh, uh, regions. I mean, like obviously the national uh, forms that we used to kind of reify, and now we think they are really not so so strictly uh, real. And uh, so, therefore, I think it's it's just really amazing. Uh, going back to the question of Brazil, I, I, I think I wanted to tie it to something that Joao was saying. That and tell me if you agree again. For me, in a way, it may be that the, this this thing, this playing around with the a paradigm of the age of revolutions. We owe something to it because it really brought us together with Brazil from the Spanish American point of view. I mean, it is kind of interesting that, I mean, there is a coincidence, right? That that, that widening of scope and that kind of process of being integrated into a larger narrative actually is what made us talk to each other with more interest and, and seriousness and also obviously productive, um, energy i think because we may it may be that it brought us in in a common conversation precisely the conversation about revolutions of course um but at the same time and, and and this is just to 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 go into maybe other other points as i was saying before i think that it's not the only thing that that we should be interested in when when we think about for example brazil and, and connections to spanish america uh one that interests me a lot of course is the question of slavery uh, both in its growth and its its uh, abolition eventually, and the contrasts that these two uh, regional, broadly speaking, Spanish American and Brazilian cases uh, inspire in our minds, right? Because we tend to think as, as about Brazil alongside Cuba as as going into a, a very specific type of direction. Of course, the growth of slavery and the Latin American and uh, Spanish side being more uh, kind of the abolition of slavery. And I think, again, putting them together forces us to complexify those ideas that are very simplistic, right? To assume that these are just opposing cases because in reality they were connected, going back to the, the magical word. And so I think that once you see those connections, it's impossible to think of them as completely different or, or, or standing in a, in a dichotomic relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, Marcela, that is also, I mean, I think one kind of a new field to hear because uh, basically because that's the one that I have been exploring is like also the history of information. Like, I mean, aside from intellectual history is also the history of information, how, how people are learning about, you know, what's happening in other places and, you know, newspapers, and kind of a public sphere, public opinion is something that is also connecting 
these different regions, and it's also kind of a new field that has been developing in the last 15 years, I think. And um, so, but kind of a following uh, to Marcela's point about enslaved people in, and you know, their experiences with independence or within these uh, revolutions. I also wanted to kind of bring out the, the question about how in the last 20 years, 30 years, Latin American historians um, have been looking into these kind of a usually neglected groups uh, that we have been seeing following, you know, kind of a Thompson's ideas of supporting caste. We have a, a group of people who seem to be uh, experiencing the revolution, but not participating in the revolution. There has been this idea that uh, usually the revolution, the Latin American independence has always been seen from the perspective of these uh, white elites, Creoles, who are the ones building the republic, building the nation states. And in the last 30 years, we've been including, you know, the questions of indigenous subjects, uh, enslaved people, free black workers, peasants, even uh, women. There has been very interesting uh, works on, on the participation of women and, and kind of a gender analysis on independence. And I wanted to ask you in your own particular works, so you don't have to, to give me like a general question, but I know all of you have worked with this idea of, you know, paying attention to different social groups. How do you think that looking into either the enslaved person or the royalist uh, indigenous um, leader or the uh, black soldier, how looking into these um, popular groups have enhanced or complicated our view of Latin American independence processes? I mean, I don't know who wants Should to- Should I start? Yes. Yeah. So in my own field of war studies, the shift has been major these last 20 years. I mean, it was par excellence the, the, the field that was obsessed with these big men like Bolivar and San Martin, the founding fathers of the patria, they were all generals. So the, the analysis usually stopped there. And that's why military history was a little bit out, out, outdated and practically banned from academia for a long time. But now with an understanding that popular classes were main actors of this process, we realize, of course, that the armies were made of the file and rank the rank and file soldiers and militiamen of these units were all from the popular sectors. And this was the main factor of participation for these classes was the army to, to be in military service. And through documentation, we've been able to actually track them down, quantify their impact. And we see that they, they had a huge impact in, in the revolution, but also they have strategies mm -hmm. and they have uh, their own interests and the, their own views of the revolution. And we now know that a crucial factor in the success or the failure of uh, any military campaign was due to the fact that the soldiers had to believe in the cause in order mm -hmm. to, to fight. Otherwise, they would just desert or mutiny or other things that they could do and it uh, just disappeared. An army could disappear in, in, in five days if the soldiers uh, did not believe in the cause. So that's very important. That's a crucial distinction in the way of thinking about agency. Who has mm -hmm. agency in a revolution? Mm -hmm. Who has effectively the capacity to affect the outcome? And it has become very clear that popular classes were a major player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to follow up that question, I was thinking like in the recent book that uh, David Bell just um, published that's about charismatic figures. Yeah. And I think it's, it's like a, it's coming back to the big man, but from the perspective of what is charisma, yeah. because there wouldn't be charisma without, you know, these are kind of a social group supporting or not these leaders. So it's just a, it's a comeback to look at leadership, but from the perspective of who supports that leadership. So that's- Who empowers that's, them. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's interesting. Um, I don't know if Joao or Marcela would like to talk about their own, your own kind of a research experiences looking into these kind of a traditionally neglected social actors. Joao? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as you see, I wrote some sketches here and I'm trying to change them according to our discussion. <laughs> so I'm, I'm taking notes 
and trying to um, to follow up the discussion. Well, um, in the last decades, our comprehension, that's true, Cristina, that's true, our comprehension of Latin American independence movements and Latin American history as a whole has become more wild, complex, white, white, not wild, white, mm -hmm. complex, and true due to the increasing focus on different social groups until then not well considered by our historiographies. That's true. About this topic, of course, you, Cristina, you, Marcela, you, Alejandro, uh, you have much more to say than me. I would just like to point that in the context of Brazilian independence bicentenary, which is going along precisely now during this year, mm -hmm. it is interesting, it is very interesting, but also alarming to notice hundreds of people, including professional historians, dreaming about the past and exaggerating the role of, for example, women, enslaved people, indigenous people, free black workers, as if they were the main forces of Brazilian independence. They were there, but they were not the main forces. As we all know, as we all know very well, the pressures of our time can easily falsify the past. So these pressures must be kept under control, in my opinion, to avoid the interdiction, to avoid the destruction of historical analysis. So this is, this is a, a great scenario, mm -hmm. no doubt about that but we must take care about its results. The, the, the results of this scenario can be, um, well, worst. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Marcela would like to, to kind of participate now and I'm going to push her. Yes, no, <laughs> because, of course. Because Marcela works, I mean, this is the thing, the, the new work, she's, com she's coming from, I don't need to say, but she's coming from understanding popular royalism and now she's moving to slavery and abolition. And of course, you know, the big problem here in the middle is independence. And, and I think, you know, in the ways you see into armed free labor, you might question into what extent they are experiencing the revolution differently from the other part of the society. So I don't know, Marcel, if you want to jump in and, and reflect on that. Yeah, I mean, that's that, that there's so much in that question. And I was just trying to also digest what, what Joao gave us, <laughs> uh, because I, I mean, in some ways, I think the reason why the what, what what I would call the popular sectors, but I don't think it's a perfect term, but it includes some of the people that Christina mentioned, indigenous peoples, black soldiers, free black workers, women peasants, you know, the, 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 the reason why they became so central, I think, to our studies of independence are, are I'm going to just mention two. One of them has to do with actually Alejandro's own specialization, which is the, the, the army. I mean, like you, you already told us how central they are to the actual independence processes. So that already lead, led us to, to really understand. I mean, there, there is a massive social force here and we want to take into account partly what he said, how they are experiencing these uh, independence processes and, and really to give, give them some political um, depth, no? not to see them just as soldiers or like another narrative that would just make them cannon fodder or something like that. I do think that we had inherited very complicated paradigms, unfortunately, of the social sciences that tended to see the social actors of the popular classes as sometimes, um, you know, like perhaps uh, manipulated or ideas that had to do with them not really having um, a very polished uh, intellectual connection to the to the independence wars. And this is where we came in to really rectify this, because if we consider, and this takes us back to the beginning of our conversation, really what is happening with, with these revolutions, right? It's the processes of not only uh, anti-colonial wars, but also uh, nation making. It's kind of impossible that people would not really be involved and, and actually in touch with these very powerful ideas and these very powerful, again, political processes in which they did participate, I think. And that's where I, I wanted to understand better what Joao told us, because in a way, I, I don't know if you were saying that you think we have exaggerated this, which I would be very happy to obviously discuss if we have time. 
I think that it's the essence of the process that leads us to think, okay, if these are not just ideas as the more traditional way of thinking about the age of revolutions, again, in the just books, philosophy, you know, normative legal theory or things like that, that are kind of coming from above and shaping the world or not, right? <laughs> as in the case of Latin America, uh, then we want to see these ideas in action. And I really think that that's where it becomes really interesting because that's where you see that, I mean, at least that's the argument that, that some of the historians mixing or com combining social, cultural, and political history are, are offering. These ideas are really being made in part because of the insistence and the engagement and, and the, the more radical interest that these popular classes are bringing uh, with their actions and, and, and also, you know, obviously with their, uh, their own interpretations. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if, if Joao would like to kind of uh, answer back to Marcela, like what exactly do you mean when you say that historians have exaggerated the role of the popular uh, groups, just to follow Marcela's terminology? <laughs> I was considering, first of all, uh, the, the Brazilian case nowadays mm -hmm. and um, the lack of, um, of um, how can I say, of attention to the, um, to the conservative structures of um, Brazilian society of the 19th century, mm -hmm. which um, uh, put all this social diversity under some patterns. Yeah. And uh, the pressures of our time uh, that are creating those exaggerating um, ideas about, mm -hmm. well, uh, just one example. Here is uh, there's a fashion to, um, uh, to say that uh, Leopoldina, the wife of Pedro I, was the main person directing Brazilian process of independence. <laughs> which is a, a, an idea total, totally crazy, yeah? just because she was a woman. Yeah? Uh, this is not something new. This is just something fitted to, um, to our time. I think it's normal. Yeah? And uh, it's great to observe and to analyze the construction of memories um, inside uh, the historiography. But I was not criticizing any specific case related to Spanish America, just, um, well, um, uh, uh, just uh, giving um, a warn, yeah? Uh, we must keep these pressures, uh, pressures of our time under control if mm -hmm. we want not to solve our problems in the past, but, but to explain the past and then to explain, of course, our present times. Just that, in, in, in general, uh, in a general view, of course, I, I, I agree with Marcel's statement. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, and perhaps this is a... not a pole I, I, I think it's not a polemical frame. Yeah, mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. a, an observation. I think it's necessary to make. Yeah, that that's uh, interesting, and maybe I mean this is a good moment to look. There's one. One question that, that we have, a couple of questions, but one in particular might be interesting to address now. There's a Silvia Escanilla Huerta. Uh, she's asking if you, we can assign to the idea, uh, if we can talk about the idea of popular sovereignty, just because that's precisely what we're talking about, this idea of popular groups coming together. But what is, how is the popular sovereignty kind of embedded in the idea of the Latin American uh, movement? Because as we all know, this was crucial in the idea, not only in Latin America, but it's even crucial in the Constitución de Cádiz, right? This idea that because of the crisis, we have to think of, you know, popular sovereignty. So if, does anyone would like to kind of take that question how, oh, okay, they basically raised it, but it's about popular sovereignty and how that was framed within the idea of, of Latin American independence, either in Brazil or uh, Spanish America. Marcela, right? Yes, I mean, I'm happy to, to say it in part because I do think it connects so well with, with what we're just discussing right now, and it would give it a little bit more shape, right? Like it's not just so abstract to think about 
how important and, and radical were the processes of constitution writing in, in the Latin American independence processes that had, uh, on one hand, empire-wide proportions. So that's interesting too, because it takes us back to Cristina's question about the, the Iberian Atlantic as a framework, right, in which we don't necessarily have to look at these fragmented spaces that later are going to become the nations and have their own kind of constitutions, but we can even look at, a, at an imperial constitution that is the constitution of Cadiz and how interesting those challenges of creating a national empire uh, were, in which at the center uh, would be the question uh, or, or the beginning of a conversation about this issue of popular sovereignty or uh, the, 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 the government of the people, right? In, if you then move to the other side of the Atlantic and really look specifically at what is happening in the, in the Spanish American territories, then you can see how powerful again this becomes because obviously that's really what opens the, the door to thinking about independence and, and kind of delinking from the, the, the authority and, and the, the, the monarchical uh, power. And, and it's a, a very interesting uh, fast, complicated, convoluted even process of, of constitution writing, especially in certain regions, like in the northern part of uh, South America, the region now, Venezuela and Colombia. Uh, but what we see there, and this is another opportunity to really highlight the, the historiography, how it has really latched on to these, these uh, processes to, to think of Latin America as the vanguard. I mean, uh, historian James Sanders, for example, would call it the vanguard of the Atlantic world. And he goes as, as, as uh, deep as to, to suggest that this is really where democracy is being uh, produced precisely. Mm -hmm. And again, this connects to the, the Palmerian paradigm and all the things we've been talking about. In, in, in the fact that the institutions that were created uh, based on this idea of popular sovereignty initially were really quite radical, but that this is also a period that was somewhat overshadowed by something that happens obviously later where the, in, the, in the process of nation building and in the kind of the very much connected to what Joao said of the, the more conservative forces, let's call them like that, are going to start taking over and really trying to, to, to tame the revolutionary uh, and democratic potential of, of these ideas put mm -hmm. into practice in the in the state building processes across the Spanish Americas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's interesting, Marcela, that you mentioned this because in a way you're kind of also addressing uh, Lowell Gustafson's question. I'll come back later to that. Um, I wanted to bring Laura Sanders a question. She's a professor in the Spanish department at Villanova. And she's asking, would you think that an important aspect of study would be the amount of options available to choose the terms of participation available to the different social actors? And, and I think this is a, an interesting question because we have this tendency to think, there are two things that, that happens in the histor historiographical, histor historical imagination. So one is the idea that we tend to think on linear ways, like, you know, things go progressively from, you know, being more conservative to radical, and, and that's, that's a it's a trap, it's a, it's a trick that we should avoid because the idea is that, you know, things don't go linear, they just go to different, depending on the social groups and the kind of pressures that emerge at react, reactions and actions are important to see it in a, like a back and forward movement. So, so that's one thing. The second thing is that we have the tendency to think that historical actors had a very clear idea what's happening and what they wanted to do. And one of the things that I tried to convince myself all the time while doing history is that people are confused. They're trying to figure out what are the options for them, what kind of options they can use or will benefit them or not, or groups that they are attached to. And this is why, you know, I, I do love the people who work on commercial history and diplomacy, because it shows how there are clashes of interest going on depending on, on the region. So, so I think we have to be gentle or understanding to our historical actors and, and see that they are confused, especially because again, the revolutions are moments of destruction and creation and the people are all the time thinking, what is going to be destroyed and how that's going to affect me and how can we create something new that will protect me or my group or my family or you know the group that I belong to in terms of either um, 
guilds or uh, kind of a social representation. So, so I, I do think, Laura, I'm just kind of addressing your question. I do think that is a confusing moment and people are thinking about their different options and they're making decisions. And sometimes in making that decisions, they cannot perfectly calculate how others are gonna react. And, and we see this, this is not only in reference to Latin American independence, but this is something that we look when we study any revolutionary movement. And then, you know, Laura is an expert on Cuba, but the Cuban revolution is also an amazing, important moment of looking at the options. And then we see a process that started less radical and radicalized with time, right? So, so I think that's, that's, it's just important to keep that, that in mind in the ways that we imagine the past. I don't know if my, my colleagues agree with me with this idea that we should be yeah. giving them some credit to be confused. And that's why, I mean, in Venezuela, it's very common to say that early politicians in, in like early 19th century Venezuela were camaleones, right? Like they change sides all the time because they're protecting their interests. And I go like, well, maybe that's the way you have to be in order to survive. You, be, you have to be a camaleon. You have to change groups in order to survive and protect your interests. The interest. veletas, they yeah. change them also. Exactly, exactly. Because they change right. with the wind. Uh -huh. Right, exactly. So Lowell Gustafson, also a professor of political science here at Villanova, is asking a question. He's saying, he's saying thank you for an excellent reconsideration of Latin American independent movements. Here's my question. Given Iturbide's short-lived monarchy in Mexico to the unrealized idea about the Inca dynastic regime expressed by Argentina Belgranos and supported by Jose de San Martin, how important for some revolutionary was the idea of conservative revolt being backed to a more traditional Habsburgian era culture, this is before the Bourbons, from before the Bourbons, Napoleon's replacement and Ferdinand Fitt. So into what extent there is a nostalgia for the Hamburg era in the times that you, in the places that you, that you are studying? And this is, goes more to either Marcela or, or Alejandro. Maybe Alejandro can jump in. Yeah, I think that monarchical nostalgia in general will be quick to come back after the first Republican euphoria of the revolution, when political actors start to see the, the problems of revolution and the destruction it causes and the social upheaval and the impossibility to reestablish a form of order. So even in a place like Buenos Aires and Rio de la Plata, where there was not a comeback to monarchical forms, Actually, what they are trying to establish is a way to recover this authority, this uh, Bourbon or Habsburgian authority, and they will be doing that for many decades. And the, the main redactor of the Constitution of 1853, Alberti, mm -hmm. which, was, which is the Constitution that we have right now in Argentina with some modifications, he clearly stated that we could not go back to monarchical ways because the people would not allow it because they were Republican after 50 years of revolution. But we needed to have, like Bolivar said, a president, a, 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 a monarch with the name of president. I mean, the same authority, but in a constitutional president that people will tolerate because that's the only way to govern these, these countries, these peoples that are not, a, are not prepared to Republican life, to be citizens as we ask them for. So we have to prepare them over a period of time that will be a very long transition of maybe 30, 40, 50 years up to a point where we will have true democracy. So this idea is not only present in the revolutionary period but in the state building process that came after that, it was still present the idea that actually we had lost as a country a way of established authority and mm -hmm. we could not regain it without some kind of monarchical presence. Yeah, and that's how sometimes it, it is tied to the idea of, of caudillismo in the 19th century yes. in Latin America. Yeah, 
We have a comment. Uh, um, go, ahead, go ahead, Marcela. I mean, I want to say something, but I, I know I should keep it short. I just thought it was such an interesting question. And, and thank you to process, Professor Gustafsson for the question, because in some way I had never thought about this question. And I, I want to tell you what I had thought about, which is connected, because you took us back to the Habsburgs, which are precisely the, like, we already know the, the dynasty before the, the Bourbons that are the ones uh, that are mostly and most commonly linked to the independence wars precisely as a reaction. And so we're very used to having this repeti repetitive idea that, you know, because of the Bourbon reforms, then the independence processes began because people reacted against them. They didn't like the reforms. And that had really blinded us, I think, to something that the new historiography has brought to light, which is actually the interesting connections between the independence independent republics even, uh, and the Bourbon reforms themselves, right? So in many ways, we have been able to trace some genealogies of Spanish liberalism back to this Bourbon uh, period in ways that we would never have been able to see if we continued with this very patriotic, nationalistic kind of mm -hmm. tendency to think that all that the independence did was to reject Spain. So. We lost you, Marcela. Okay. Okay. Uh, instead of thinking about it that way, right, uh, we now think about the nations being uh, emerging from or being built within this larger framework of Spanish liberalism, which is what we talked about before. So that's why I thought it was so interesting to take us back to the Habsburg, and I guess Alejandro could give a, you know, you could see that better, but I had never really thought about it. So thank you for, for the question because I, I will continue thinking about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. May I add something, Christina? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I think it is important to consider that in this context that we are discussing here, but also for decades after Latin American independences, Monarchical projects can be revolutionary projects, can imply deep changes mm -hmm. in, a, in a society. On the other hand, some Republican projects can carry <laughs> very conservative um, uh, characteristics, mm -hmm. yeah, can be very conservative in many ways. And I think it has to deal with your, um, your idea, Cristina, in the political dimensions of reality, changing positions is something very normal. <laughs> what seems contradictory, what seems an absurd, can be just coherent to this dynamic of a political life of societies as those societies in 19th century Latin America that were, well, um, uh, creating something new all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. just that. Yeah, thank you. So we do have a comment by Diego Holstein. Thank you very much for a very stimulating conversation in which among other things you discuss how revolutionary were these revolutions, but then how independent was the independence, hence to the role of British informal empire and dependency theory. We have a long question by my friend and colleague, Jesse Cromwell, Hi, scholars. This has been a wonderful and stimulating conversation. Thank you, Jesse. I'm wondering what do you think about the role of cultural, social, slash intellectual creolization in recent work on Latin American independences? We have a layer of older historiography, like Richard Graham and others, that said that colonies culturally separated from Spain as they came into their sense of Americanness or nation, uh, American, uh, uh, I guess, Creole pat uh, pat patriarchy. Francisco Javier Caldijero, for example. Then another wave of historiography came to prominence that says that said no independence is about a crisis of sovereignty, like Jeremy Adelman, Jaime Rodriguez, and others. Recently, there are books like the one by Joshua Simons, The Ideology of Creole Revolution, Independence, and Imperialism in America and Latin American Political Thought, that seem to have returned to the idea of this creolization paradigm. So where do specialists on independences, such as yourselves, stand on this idea of creolization? Who would like to jump in? 
Alejandro, ¿tú? <laughs> o yo, ok. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a great question. Hi, Jesse, thank you. Because in part, I mean, I really enjoy teach and, and like to think with Josh Simon's book. So it's very appropriate, I think, to, to what we're doing today here. And, I, and thank you for bringing it up. I think that, I mean, I, I'll, I'll also summarize quickly for the audience something that I think he's doing that is very, very important, which is to invite us and not just us actually, but historians of the United States and the American Revolution to think about both the American Revolution, quote unquote, and the Latin American independence movements in a singular frame, which is no other than actually thinking about the Americas mm -hmm. and the hemisphere in the age of revolutions together. It's something that if you think about it that way, it sounds very natural, right? But it has taken us again so long to get to this point, in part because all of these things we've been discussing all, already for a while, which I can go into. Uh, and so in many ways, it's so creative to just ask really, instead of always thinking about the United States with France, which is in another continent clearly, and with, of Latin America with Africa, which is also in, not just in another continent, but another century. <laughs> uh, why don't we see what was going on in this in this American continent uh, that that may have been? The, I mean, for him, the thread is really the Creoles, and so on one hand, he's doing a very experimental and very interesting for for that reason um, process of thinking about the United States founding fathers as Creoles, which is a term that is not regularly used to talk about them, mm -hmm. and then to put uh, someone like let's say Simon Bolivar at the level of, of, of these people who have generally been thought to be producing political theory, and which is of something that of course is, is very hardly granted to a, to a Latin American. So ultimately why I think this is important to, to, to explain is because I wouldn't say that, that Josh is returning us to the question of creolization. I mean, so in some way, although unfortunately I can't really see Jesse at this moment, I would not necessarily agree that this is what is at stake, although I really like the way that you created for us a very neat uh, historiographical map of how to link these ideas. And again, thank you, because I will obviously continue thinking about to what extent that is there as well. But I think that because Joe Simon is not a Latin Americanist, and I don't want to get too technical about this, <laughs> he may not be embedded in that debate in the same way as we are. So maybe this is a question just for us, right? Like, how do we deal with this? And do we really want to take it up? And so I'll give my answer in two seconds because I know, uh, you know, I should be brief, but I think that also we do not necessarily, we cannot really go back to that paradigm of the creolization because that was such a top-down Eurocentric way of thinking about independence that this is another one of the things we've been saying tonight we, we really, I don't think we can go back to that at all. I think that right now you have to think of a, a wider uh, kind of palette of actors that are involved in, in these independence processes. And therefore there would, it would be very hard to, to really start to think about the Creoles as being the main actors mm -hmm. or their identities being really the, the driving force of independence in any way. Um, yeah, I think that that's that's more or less the answer that I would give. And I think that at the same time, what 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 Josh is offering as as this idea that what the North Americans and the uh, rest of the Creoles in the Americas are are doing, which is to create a, some sort of a imperial anti-imperialism uh, <laughs> in their in their way of understanding their role in, in independence is really the real challenge of understanding how the relationship of the Creoles is going to be with these other groups that they are uh, interacting with in these political revolutions, right? Which has to do again with the Alejandro's study of, of the armies, right? Like, is it really possible to have uh, an anti-colonial uh, project or is it actually absolutely necessary that it's anti-colonial because it involves so many people and, and such wide uh, groups uh, and, and classes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other comments on that? 
or can I move? I just I have I do have a question for for Joe. Just for oh, yes, go ahead. Jo, 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 uh, one minute, not more. Um, we have uh, large traditions of um, creolization models in different historiographies in America, in Europe. I think it's important to consider these traditions to avoid some mistakes that were very common in the past, but um, that can be easily avoided nowadays in terms of uh, considering any sign of creolization as a sign of a political project, of a national identity, of an, um, a natural destiny to the political process, just that. I think it's, it's very interesting to, to study, to consider these traditions, these historiographical, these historiographic traditions of um, creolization models. They are mm -hmm. all up, every, everywhere, yeah? Yeah, thank you, thank you. So I do have like a final question. We have five minutes and I wanna start with Joao because I know this year Brazil is celebrating their independence. And just because I'm always thinking about the political uses of the past, I wanted to ask you like, what, what are the celebrations? What are, how, what is the discourse that either the Brazilian state or Brazilians themselves are using to celebrate or commemorate the 200 years of independence? How, what is the, uh, what are the political discourses that have been, are being attached to the celebration? That's, this is, it's a, it's a curiosity that I have. Yeah, thanks. We have two, uh, three major forces. First, historians that are doing all the same, <laughs> just studying, just explaining, researching, historians in general. Mm -hmm. We have uh, also uh, a lot of historians that are, are making a great effort to, to be in touch with society in general. This is very interesting hundreds and hundreds of different and great initiatives trying to, well, to, 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 to criticize the, um, the, 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 the commemoration, the, the bicentenary as, um, well, and, and, and changing it in something critical, yeah? And the, the third force is the, the government force which mm -hmm. is trying to do something, but uh, our luck is that this government uh, is not able to, to do many things, yeah? just because they don't know how to do. Mm -hmm. I repeat, thank God, <laughs> but they are trying to, um, to, to, to rescue the most conservative traditions mm -hmm. in our historical culture in terms of um, uh, nostalgia of slavery, of um, oh, really? uh, uh, yeah, oh, wow. an idea of a, a, a white society, of an European society, ignoring indigenous people, Brazilian diversity. So <laughs> I repeat for the last time, thank God they can't do many things because they they don't know how to govern yeah that's it yeah that's that's uh that's shocking to say the least and i i wonder is there so so joao is there any sense of kind of a um clashing forces between the kind of a intellectual brazilians who are trying to be critical and this kind of a more conservative view from the yeah. government all okay. the time, all the time. Okay. The, the, this clash is part of uh, our scenario, which is very interesting, but also important to take part in it and to do something to, um, well, to create a better future for us. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So when, when are the elections in Brazil? Uh, October. Yeah, October. So it's gonna be a, it's gonna be an issue also, right? Yeah. It has been an issue since last year, yeah. Okay, and I think we also have elections coming up in Colombia, right, Marcela? And do you see any kind of a political uses of the past regarding independence, like being in the public sphere conversation or not really? 
No, I think the, the slavery question should be a little more present because of the abolition also being co co coinciding last year. Mm -hmm. But I think that that uh, the pandemic also made most of the uh, independence celebrations for the 1820s kind of, it, they didn't work out in the way that they were expected to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the same happened in Venezuela. And I, I don't know, Alejandro, if you have like a... Uh what's going on in Argentina with uh, independence celebrations or these kind of uses, uh, political no, uses? No, luckily it's back. over already. <laughs> so we, we can relax a little bit because it's been quite a busy few years. Okay, and what is your, what is your, uh, what is your take on what they celebrated during these two years? Like, how do you see, I mean, what, is the, what was the main discursive force of celebration? I mean, all over the continent, in, in Chile, in now we have the Peruvian independence, but we saw emerge what's the, the fact that all this historiographical discussion that we've had uh, recently between us and talking about this last 20 to 30 years has not permeated enough to the political decisions, mm -hmm. nor the uh, main mainstay uh, discussions in the public eye and national conscience. So they were absolutely nationalistic, mm -hmm. the independences in each country and with the blinders on as if everything ended in the natural borders of our own countries today. So that's been a, a, a huge discussion that we, I think we, we gave it. I don't know if we won, I don't think so, but at least we had this argument with uh, local uh, politics in terms of let's try to think this in a more regional way, a more Iberian way, mm -hmm. a more South American way. And it was interesting in that sense, but there's a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Alejandro, don't you think it is scary to see how many people in our countries believe that celebrations are made just to celebrate <laughs> not to criticize not to think not to learn something just celebrate <laughs> it really depends on the political color of the president you have at the moment i yeah. cannot imagine a worse president to have to no, this kind it's of impossible celebration that bolsonaro <laughs> right now Every it's impossible yeah. Yeah. yeah neither yeah. can i imagine <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. So with that note, and um, so one of the things I just wanted to end by saying that one of the ideas of the LePage, this uh, LePage for the uh, history and the public interest is precisely to do what you described, Alejandro, that's lacking, which is like connecting intellectual thinking and, and criticism with the general public and bringing this discussion to the general public. So I appreciate you uh, sharing with me these uh, important ideas that you brought out today. And I'm just gonna leave it to Elizabeth, who's probably coming to say goodbye.